Thank you, worship team. I invite you to turn your Bibles now. Let you sit and listen for a bit. We'll do it that way. We started a message, uh, a series last week on the Lord's Prayer. And we'll be doing that for three months. But we said this week we're going to take a little pause. And this is a Sunday um, that has been known as Sanctity of Life Sunday. And I, man, I love worship in this place. We just sang the gospel. Those three songs. The Puritan prayer that was a prayer corporately of us repenting even of our repentance. And we sang of the preciousness of Jesus' blood. There's some reasons why we did that to start today. <sighs> Sanctity of Life Sunday, so why is that? This is the anniversary roughly of Roe versus Wade. Why would we take time to look at God's word on this particular thing? We don't tend to be a church that picks up lots of different issues, but I want to assure you, this is not a political issue. Our culture has made it that, and our culture lies to us all the time. Do we know that? It lies to us all the time. We must see and understand God's word. And this is a sin of our culture, which has tainted all of us in some kind of a way. There's some way in which we're all affected and some way in which we're all guilty. So I want to confess to you, um, my own reluctance even on speaking of such a subject. And I, um, <clears throat> so why this? I, uh, I realize that abortion is one of those things that touches people, and it's sometimes a thing that nobody can talk about. And what we're saying in the gospel has to do with guilt and shame removed. So this is where we're starting, right here. Sometimes a particular thing affects a person, and they are so full of guilt they can't ever speak of it. And I'm aware that's true in a congregation of our size. And here's what, I, here's what we just sang, and here's what I want to bring in the beginning. Jesus, perfect righteousness. His precious blood, as we sang it, paid for all of our sin. All of our sin. Guilt and shame is removed for those who have been awakened and believe and repent. There's nothing that we can do to remove our sin, and Jesus has done it all. And believe me, he is enough to do it all. And he has. It's his declaration. Listen to God's word. 1 John 1 and 2. If we say we've no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, look at look what it says about him. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. Who can do that? He is just to forgive. That is, God is righteous to forgive. Why is he? Because his son has paid for that sin. It actually is. It's actually accomplished. It actually is finished. This is God's word. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word's not in us. To ignore is not truthful. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Bible's very clear on naming our enemy as the accuser of the brethren. We are sometimes familiar with that voice. The problem is he says partial truths. And what he leaves out is that we have an advocate. Jesus, the righteous one. So we start there this morning. My confession is this. There have been times I've wanted to avoid this subject because I don't want to hurt someone. I don't want to hurt anyone. I want to preach the gospel. What did I just say? There's been times when I've maybe... Been, I've been concerned about this subject because I don't want to hurt someone. What I just said was, in that moment of recognition, 
that I would care more about what someone would think about me than the lives of unborn children, 3,000 of which are killed every single day by abortion. And what kind of a sin is that? So I'm starting from the beginning this way, recognizing that I know that guilt and shame hit all of us in different ways. But we must bring those things to the cross. And God's word de- declares to us emphatically that we have an advocate before the Father who is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. And God is faithful and he is just to forgive and to cleanse, to wash away. That brings worship to him. It magnifies Jesus. He is worthy. And let me say this. His blood is precious. He is holy, holier than all of my sin. It, it, it is to, to say that, to deny that is to say that my sin would be greater than Christ. It dishonors him. So in all my fears and all my shame, whatever things have been done, I need to bring that to Jesus. And this is God's word. So I would say receive God's word in that. One of... Um, my favorite books is by Paul Miller. He wrote the, the Praying Life. We did a series on that a while back. His father, Jack, was a really well-known Presbyterian preacher and was often fond of saying this, this thing. Faith is looking ten times more at the cross than at my sin. There's a reality of sin, but we must. It is an act of faith to look at the cross and embrace it. So let us do that. I'm acknowledging that in the beginning before we get into these texts. And I will say this also. Um, I think these are on the welcome table. There's a little booklet written by David Pollison uh, that's powerful. It's rich and practical. It just says, Healing After Abortion. It's God's mercy for you. And if it, that's for you or for a friend, there's some there. Welcome and, and, and take them there. So we begin just simply saying, We need to receive God's grace and forgiveness. We all need healing. On the other hand, to avoid a subject that is near to God's heart because I'm afraid of hurting someone is grossly wrong. For a pastor to not communicate clearly what the Bible says about the sacredness of human life and God is to be in some way, I think, possibly complicit. To avoid speaking out on behalf of millions of little ones who are defenseless, who have literally no voice, because of the risk of hurting or offending someone, I think in some ways to incur the judgment that Jesus speaks about for those who might harm little ones, where he says a millstone should be around their neck. So today's a different kind of preaching than normal. This is, in a sense, the prophetic role of preaching the Bible. It's not always pleasant, but let us say it is needed from time to time. This is for all of us, and it's for future generations. To assume we know these things is to think wrongly. What we assume we know, we forget. So, here it is. <clears throat> uh, we do understand that our society is at war with God's truth. It is in so many ways. I'll give you just some examples of our inconsistency. Um, some would say that a pet dog has more rights than a prenatal child. It's true. It's true. Our laws actually support the powerful over the weak. That is the rights of the mother over the rights of an unborn child. In other areas of society, we will not allow that. But in this case, we support, our laws support the powerful over the weak. Those who can speak loudly over little ones who have no voice. They are defenseless. They need an advocate. So we are... Our society uses terms like embryo and and fetus, but for all of history, we'd have called this a child, a baby, not yet born. History is against us. That historically, we would have seen the child being formed, regardless of stage, that being formed and being an act of God. Even from the second century, um, the writing of the church is that way. From Didache in the epistle of Barnabas, it says, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not corrupt boys, you shall not commit fornication, you shall not steal, you shall not deal in magic, you shall do no sorcery, you shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill them when born, which was typical of leaving them to the elements. And that's actually adoption and many Christian institutions were started then by rescuing unwanted children. That has been history. 
So we're going to be in John chapter 9 in a moment, but what I wanted to do, last year at this time, we read, um, we, the preaching was through Psalm 139. I'm going to ask Pam and Emily to come, if you guys would come and read a portion of Psalm 139 to us. And this is God's word. Let's listen to it as it's read. Psalm 139, oh, thanks, 1 through 6. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Verses 13 to 16. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Let's pray together. Lord, we are stilled and sobered. We have this morning reflected and thought and sung of the gospel. And we come here because Jesus is the magnificent one, creator and savior, the redeemer of our lives. We come here because of him and your work through him, because of a love that has been poured out on us, that which is undeserved by us. And we come confessing our need. We come confessing that we've not thought rightly about many things. We come as ones who've sometimes, oft times, most times, been more concerned about us than the things you care about. So today, Lord, let us see life like you see it. Show us where we have not seen it like you see it. And Lord, it and affect us in ways that we haven't even imagined. Maybe even ways that won't even be specifically preached today. Affect us with you. We invite, we ask, as we know that in every way we need your work in us, and so we ask for it today. May it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I continue with this question. Uh, when, When does life begin? When does life begin? Prenatally, what is, what is happening? So I'd like us to begin thinking about this theologically and physiologically. So on, on one hand, the Bible is not a textbook for prenatal development, but on the other hand, as we heard just a portion of Psalm 139, it's very clear that God is forming a person in the womb. You probably remember that there's this wonderful encounter. Sometimes we read it in December. It's in Luke chapter 1. It's the, the encounter of Elizabeth and Mary, uh, or we would say the prenatal encounter of John the Baptist and Jesus. We're told by Luke that, that Elizabeth is about six months pregnant and Mary is barely pregnant. They don't have internet travel. It's So in terms of the information about what's going on, Mary... Elizabeth was not informed by some other source. But you remember this in Luke chapter 1. It's in those days that Mary arose and she went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered a house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth, six months pregnant, heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. 
And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The baby leaped for joy. The prenatal encounter of Jesus and John the Baptist. So when does life begin? Hang on, let's pause a second. Is that the right question? Who, who's asking that question? It gets asked. You hear it asked times. Who, who asks that question? Who declares that at conception this is not life? Or this is not human? Or when does someone become a person? Who decides that? From the very moment of conception, there is growth and change at a rapid rate. Varying rates throughout the entire time a child is within the womb. From conception until when? Until that child comes down the birth canal? They stop growing then? Continue growing and changing. Still growing and changing in adolescence. The brain keeps growing until you're in your 20s. Think of the mystery of creation, the mystery of conception, of life beginning. What makes that particular sperm fertilize that egg? God. Psalm 139, we heard it clearly. My friends, God has no unwanted pregnancies. That is a man-made term. It is not in God's vocabulary. The very giving and taking of life is God's domain. So we would be wise to agree with Job that it's God who gives and God who takes away. This is His realm, His responsibility. It is not ours. So today we're going to look at John 9, a slightly different section, a life that displays the work of God. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me um, there to John chapter 9. Larry Priest and I were interacting about this, this account in the lobby. Um, we won't get this thoroughly, and I'm taking it from one particular vantage point. But let me just remind us of John's purpose in doing so. John writes his gospel um, later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John has, um, unique to John, has this wonderful dialogues of Jesus. And, and chapter 9 is one of the really long encounters. It's, so you have Jesus encountering people. But what John wants us to understand is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So he does this through narrative and these encounters of Jesus and various statements that Jesus is making about himself. So we we see in this particular man really a progression of belief. But I'm taking this because this man is viewed a particular way in this society. He was viewed a common way. But we see the way Jesus interacts with him and some aspects of God and the way life is viewed here is very different than the way that society was. And we see this man coming. He's awakened and coming to faith in Christ. So it's the encounter of Jesus, the man born blind, and we see embedded in that the value of human life. I'll read just here um, the first 16 verses to start with. And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. They said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? I don't don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the blood and opened his, made the mud and opened his eyes So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, 
he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. We'll pause here. Seth and Shannon are to my right. I think Jack is going to teach us much about how God sees life. I fully expect that. The question we have is how do we determine the value of life and how does God determine it? Throughout all human history, we've determined it wrongly. Currently, right now, we determine it wrongly. Values determined by race, by intelligence, by our perception of abilities, whether it's physical or mental, by socioeconomic reasons, some places by religion. We admit that humanity has a scale of measuring the value of life that is not God's scale. We've already read God's scale, have we not? For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. My friends, God's word is very clear to us about how he sees us. We have here in verse 1 the opening scene here in John 9, this man who's blind from birth, and the disciples see him, so they are the ones who begin to ask Jesus. And the question they ask is, who sinned? that this man was born blind. So their conclusion was consistent with the common thinking of that day. This must be a punishment from God. For a man to be born blind must be the result of sin, either his sin prenatally or his parents' sin. They assume what? They assume this is a judgment of God. I am so glad they asked, aren't you? I'm so glad they asked. How many people have assumed that a certain tragedy or difficulty was a result of their sin and they were receiving the judgment of God? Many have thought that, but we're ashamed to ask that, to speak it. So I'm so glad they asked because Jesus now answers. Jesus speaks that. We see this in verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents. I'm sorry, pause. Did they sin? Had they sinned? Absolutely they had sinned. He's talking about purpose, cause and effect. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. God has purpose here. God has a purpose with this man. God has a purpose with this life. And he says, Jesus declares, it is that the works of God might be, what's the word? Displayed. In him. So when we think of that display, think of um, it's the old, the old showcase. I don't know if you go down, downtown at Christmas time and you have the display windows and the big, the big department stores. It's to display something inside. He says, This man's life, this thing that others saw as a disability or as a judgment upon him, it, there was, God wants to display. His glory, His work, and this man, that's what God wants to do in a life. So let me say this here. God loves to display His work and His glory in His people. And He has lots of ways to do that. He does not have only one way. He has many, many ways to do that. It might be that He will demonstrate His strength in us during suffering. It might be that He will miraculously heal and relieve a suffering. It might be the way in which he draws close to a person during their suffering so that there is a joy in God that demonstrates the worth of God more than anything else in the world. 
God means to display His work and His people. So if you're familiar with the story of Johnny Erickson Tata, um, she speaks of this kind of thing. So I'm going to say this again. God loves to display His work and His people, and He has many ways to do that. It might be the way He demonstrates His strength during a person's suffering. It might be the way he chooses to miraculously heal and relieve a suffering, demonstrating his power and his mercy. It might be the way he draws close to a person, indicating his intimate love and fellowship so that they would walk with him and know him deeply, that he would draw close to them during their suffering. So then they find and express their joy in God more than anything else in this world. God means to display his work and his glory in his people. Amen? So we see it in, in uh, what we read that after that question is asked, Jesus is the one who does the work. He spits in the ground. I love the word he anoints him. I mean, who thinks that is anointing? Putting mud in a guy's eye. We could, we could imagine the scene, how humorous it is. He's supposed to go wash, and he washes, and he comes back, and he sees. And then when people see him in verse 8, it's like they don't recognize him. Notice that his name is never actually used. It's like they see him as a function. They call him by what he did. Isn't this the guy who used to sit and beg? No name used here. Some say it's him. Some say, nah, it's not him. It just looks like him. He's going, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. It's me. And it's like no one's listening to him, and he tells them what happened. So finally they bring him to the Pharisees. Is it to prove he was healed or something? But they bring him here to be examined and the Pharisees begin that encounter with him. I didn't read all of this, but you see how the rest of the story is. The, the Pharisees, as they interview him, ask what happens. And so he tells them what Jesus did and so forth. And they're going like, man, how can I get It's because, you know, Jesus healed on what day? The Sabbath, which we kind of call it Jesus' favorite day to heal because they, were, they had reduced God's law to a billion man-made laws and that little making of mud. They saw that as work and dishonoring God. And God, he's healing. What does God intend to do? He's healing. They totally miss God's heart. And so there's this debate about who Jesus actually is. How can a, how can a sinner heal in that? So they ask him, what do, you, what do you say about this guy? I mean, he must be a sinner. And you know, he, he responds, well, I think he's a prophet. Well, the Jews still couldn't believe that he'd been born blind so they want to call his parents in now to testify. Well, the parents get what's going on. I mean, this whole thing, they are, this is about Jesus' identity is what this is about. This, this guy is going to display the works of God, but this is to demonstrate the mercy and the might of God. That's why Jesus does this. And so when, he come, when the parents come, you know, they will verify that, yes, this is my son. Yes, he was born blind. How, but how he got healed, we're not speaking of that one. He's of age. They, they, they don't want to be charged with blasphemy, being excommunicated from the synagogue. Let him speak. So the guy, he's out there, he's hung out there to dry. So they, they call him in a second time. But he doesn't appear to be too scared about it. He's encountered Jesus. He's probably not fully awakened, but he, but he goes through this. And so they're asking him a second time and saying, you need to give glory to God, not, 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 not this other guy here. Because we know this other guy's a sinner. And he just goes like, I, if he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. All I know is this. I was blind. Now I see. So let me just pause for a moment in terms of when we bear witness of God. You don't have to have every single theological problem answered in your mind. Don't let that be your litmus test for when you speak of Christ or not. This man is simply giving voice to what he knows. God's okay with that. God will empower that much witness. And so he says that. I, I, I used to be blind. Well, how did he open your eyes? He kind of goes, I already told you this. Were you guys not listening? So you get a little tone of sarcasm in the guy here as he's speaking to the leaders. He says, I mean, do you want to become his disciples too? He knows he's digging at them. And they revile him, saying, we're disciples of Moses. And we don't know where this guy comes from. And, and now the guy's almost getting a little, little preach. He says, well, that's kind of an amazing thing. He says to them, you don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my, not, my eyes. And we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but 
he listened to this guy. So he's just bringing to them the evidence that's right in front of them that they are clearly ignoring. Never since the beginning of earth has it ever been heard that a man who was born blind has been healed. This has to be from God. And they, you, know, you imagine them spitting on the ground or whatever they just said. You were born in sin. Again, that view of God's judgment on him. And they, they cast him out. They cast him out. It's a very interesting conclusion to this particular chapter. He's declared what he knows of Jesus. And here's what I want us to notice. And this is the way John tells his story in Jesus' words. Who's really blind here? Let me read the last few verses of this chapter. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You've seen him, and it's he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, listen, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus answered them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now you say, We see. So your guilt remains. Here's the question in the end. Who's really blind here? Who's really blind here? On this issue of life and how God views it, who is really blind? We are. Our society is blind. Our, our culture consistently chooses against God's creation, against God's commands. We know this is life. We know these are little ones, not yet born. Developing? Yes. But that does not make them less than little ones. 3,000 abortions every day. That's our national average for all kinds of reasons. According to Brian Skodek, who's a pediatric geneticist at Children's Hospital in Boston, as an article from November 2009, he says, an estimated 92% of all women who've received the prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome choose to terminate their pregnancies. While there remains a list, a long list of potential adoptive parents willing to adopt Down syndrome babies. Our society, we consistently choose the powerful over the weak. We do. It's our society. So our culture is one of our culture's sins. But my responsibility as a pastor is to this church. It's not to every single person in our country. My responsibility is here. So I want to be clear in declaring God's truth about the preciousness and the sacredness of every single life. God's purpose is to glorify himself in every single life he creates. It is. So I'm going to end this back where we started. I'm going to end this with gospel again. Colossians 2. There are some, some words I understand just by the very mention of the word, it brings pain to people. So the word divorce does that for people. That's true here. The word abortion would bring pain to people. Um, I want to bring this back. Actually, I don't know if we'll attach this. I, we might attach this to our sermon application questions, but some of you guys know Lecrae. Lecrae just came out about this um, uh, recently this year and just the, the power of, of um, confession and repentance. So I'm going to read Colossians 2, 13 to 15 as we close. It speaks of past, speaks of where we are now, and speaks of what Jesus did. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you were dead. That's us. God made you alive together with him, with Christ, raised us, having forgiven us most of our sins. Having forgiven us all 
All, all our trespasses, the things that we can't mention yet, this is God's word, having forgiven us all our trespasses, how did he do so? By canceling the record of debt. Listen to how he says it. It's at the cross. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. It's a record, but the record's expunged. It's canceled. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what happens at the execution place, the charges are right here. So when the charges said, this, this is the Christ, the Son of God. Remember the Jews said, no, 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 put up there, he said he was. So when they put that at the top, that's the list of charges. That's what they would typically do at execution. Paul draws on that metaphor and says, what Christ did is, all the record of our sins were nailed there with him. They were paid for. It's canceled. This is God's word to us. All of them. And then says, he took out the voice. He disarmed our enemy. Our accuser has no voice, no place to stand. What he says, this one is condemned, is not true, because God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse from all unrighteousness. Amen? It's the gospel. I'm wrong to skip a subject. what people may think about me. I don't want to hurt anybody. But I want, to know, I want us to know this. All our guilt, all our shame, all our bad decisions, all our sins, all our mistakes, when we've been awakened to God, He has gloriously paid for them. We've repented and come to Him that way. It makes Jesus glorious to say so. Amen? It makes Him glorious. You know what it does? It takes away the voice of the accuser. What God means to do is to display His works and glory through His people. It's the last song we sang. It's what He means to do. And He wants to do it wonderfully. So let us live humbly before Him, declaring the greatness and mercy of God and walk side alongside of our brothers and sisters without any judgment of anything done in the past, bringing each ourselves and them to our Savior who deserves to be worshipped with all of our life. Let's pray. Lord, this word on this particular Sunday is a different word than we sometimes receive, but we receive it as your word. We come here because we need you. And we come here because you are a God who speaks. And you speak to our hearts, you speak to our souls. And Lord, I pray that you will do this ongoing in a way we need to hear. For you're the one who knows each. And we submit this. We submit ourselves to you. Thank you for your mercy to us. It's immense. It's daily. And we've received it this day again. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.